He's a Harlem-born hustler. I was making like $500 a week at the age of 13. Hype man. He makes a grand entrance like he's Julius Caesar. And hit maker. I fell in love with music like you fall in love with the woman that you marry. Hey, Puffy, or Diddy, P, Papa. Papa Papa, Papa Diddy Pop. Papa Diddy. Mr. Daddy. It is P. Diddy. Sean P. Diddy Combs is a self-made music and fashion mogul at the helm of an empire worth nearly a quarter billion dollars. Uh-huh. Yeah. I guess I'm the epitome of 21st century entrepreneur. With Jennifer Lopez on his arm, he was crowned the king of hip-hop. That was like the movies. And it was the power of both of them. I don't really know how long it took her to get into the dress, but I know it only took me a second to get out of it. <laughs> oh. But Puffy's road to success was mined with turmoil and heartbreak. I wish that I didn't see so many dark things and so many tragedies. There was too much death around me. First, a gunman took the life of his best friend, rapper Biggie Smalls. It's kind of hard when you're not around. Know you in heaven smiling down. He didn't deserve to die, and it was just too much for me to handle. I was just like, yo, this is it, man. I can't do it no more. It's been two and a half years since my man Big passed. Two and a half years since my world crashed. I Still help. reeling from the loss, Puffy stepped out of the studio to pursue his dream of performing. It was like a dream come true to see the lines like in front of the stores. Can't nobody take my uh -uh, pride. Uh -uh. Can't nobody hold me down. Then he nearly lost it all when a nightclub shootout left him staring down the barrel of a 15-year prison sentence. I want to make this 100% clear. I had nothing to do with a shooting in this club. I wish I would have just stayed my ass at home and chilled with Jennifer. I just wish the whole night wouldn't have happened. And in the heat of the trial, the romance that launched a thousand headlines came to a painful end. We had decided that we didn't want to take no more attention away from her career. You know, best thing is I try to let her do her thing, you know? Now, the hip-hop pioneer whose sound, style, and marketing savvy revolutionized the music business. Man, there goes the neighbor. P. Diddy, behind the music. I promise you, it will be better than Rick James. Come on, buddy. Now say my name, come on. My name is Sean Combs. Some of you may also know me as Puff Daddy, or now I'm going by the artist formerly known as Puff Daddy as P. Diddy. He is hip-hop's answer to the great Gatsby, a streetwise champagne-sipping player in relentless pursuit of the good life. It's all about the party. It's all about the sexy. It's all about the women. Make no mistake, my man wants to party. There's no question about that. You'll jump in the SUV with him, and you'll hit all the right parties, and you'll have a booth waiting for you, and a crystal at the table. Thanks for coming, baby. Sean Combs makes success seem effortless. In reality, his empire was built on a lifetime of tireless work. When I started doing this when I was like 16, I would bust my ass and working 20 hours a day. He knows where the paper is, and he knows how to get it. Let me ask you what you got against me, because they got me public enemy number one. But in January of 2001, Puffy's kingdom was on the verge of collapse when his image and his actions were put on trial. The Manhattan Grand Jury investigation of Sean Puffy Combs has been continued. I'll be your public enemy. Your Come on, enemy. Puffy was charged with bribery and gun possession following a violent shootout in a New York nightclub and was facing up to 15 years in prison. I do not own a gun. I do not carry a gun. The charges and allegations against me 
100 uh, percent false. The trial was a, a learning experience just on how the world like perceived me. They just really think that I walk around in a fur coat, you know, with some diamonds on and drink champagne and hang out with a movie star and don't go to work and I got a temper and I flip out and that's it. You know what I'm saying? Like, like that's it. I'm like, I was just like, oh. I don't know at times if people even look at me as a person. Sean Combs practically has hustling in his blood. He was born in Harlem in 1969 into a family that bent the law to make ends meet. My father was a hustler. He was a drug dealer. You know, he was a street hustler. During that time, it was hard for a lot of black men in Harlem to get good jobs, to live a certain lifestyle. So you take chances. Sean's father, Melvin, took those chances in order to provide a better life for his children. In 1971, he bought his family a new home in the middle-class suburb of Mount Vernon, New York. But he would never see them move in. On January 26, 1972, Melvin Combs was shot dead in Central Park during a drug deal gone wrong. Growing up without a father, I mean, it was a lot of stuff that I had to learn on my own, you know. But at the same time, my mother, she was dead to pick up some of the weight. Forced to take on the role of both mother and father, Janice worked around the clock in order to maintain a comfortable suburban lifestyle for Sean and his sister Keisha. My mother was working in the daytime, then she had a night job. I don't even know where my mother slept, to be honest. I had to do like three jobs at one time, which was fine because this was my lifestyle and I wanted it to be nice. So you have to work for what you get. And if you work hard, you get what you want. It was a lesson young Sean took to heart. By the age of 12, he was already on the make. When he learned a neighborhood friend was giving up a lucrative paper route, Sean hustled his way past the long waiting list. I went in, had a little meeting with him, and I said, now you can give up this paper route and not get no money, or you can give up this paper route and, you know, I could give you like a percentage. I mean, he, he, he saw the sense in that. So, um, that was my, that was, I guess that was my first deal I brokered. Within a year, he was a major player in the Mount Vernon paper game. I was making like $500 a week at the age of like 13. I, was, I mean, I was really doing it. That, that right there started the hustle in me. That's when I started dreaming. I started having big plans from there. But Janice Combs also made sure her son knew how to have fun. On Saturday nights, the family came together to play records and dance. We used to turn on the music and bug out, you know? You have to bug out with your kids sometime, you know? Marvin Gaye, Diana Ross, like the song, I Want Muscles. I mean, all, all James Brown stuff would just be on heavy rotation in my house. Baby, baby, give me the feeling, baby. We would get in the mirror and we would do a little dancing and do a little shaking. And do, it was fun. It was really a lot of fun. By the time Sean entered college in 1987, he was an accomplished dancer and legendary partier. Puffy, as his friends now called him, majored in business at Washington, D.C.'s Howard University. But he was more interested in pleasure. I would be the first one in the club and the last one to leave. And at that time, I never went to clubs for girls. I went to clubs to dance. And you see that Sean's prowess on the dance floor caught the attention of music video directors who came to the clubs to scout new talent. I was in the Stacey Lattisaw video. I was in his Father MC video. I was in his Fine Young Cannibals video. It was on the set of those videos that Puffy learned where the real money in music was. I was always looking at the guys behind the camera, and they seemed to really be having the nice suits on and really seemed to be running things in their cell phones. So I was like, I don't know what he does, but it's something about what he does that seems like, 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 like it's, it's, it's real interesting. So in the winter of 87, 19-year-old Puffy begged his way into a meeting with Andre Harrell the CEO of a fledgling record company called Uptown Entertainment. He wore a red polka dot tie, button down shirt. He had a fade haircut low on the sides, high on the top. And he was very polite, he used to call me Mr. Harrell. I said, 
I would like to work for free. He was starting a company. He was like, oh, sure. <laughs> Come on in. You can work for free. Start off by washing that car. Three days a week, Puffy made the grueling four-hour commute from Washington, D.C. to Uptown's New York City offices. He submitted to the grunt work for six months. But when one of Uptown's creative executives quit, Puffy saw his opening and asked his boss, Andre Harrell, out to lunch. I said, you make music for the young generation. Who better to make music for the young generation than somebody young? I said, why are you looking for another a &R person? Just give me a chance. Just give me an opportunity. I wanted to make hip young music for hip young people, and I had somebody who wanted to be hip. It was perfect. So uh, I gave Puffy a shot. With Andre as his mentor, 20-year-old Sean Combs dropped out of college and became one of the youngest executives in the history of the music business. That's where the saga started. I fell in love with music like you fall in love with the woman that you marry. I couldn't even go to sleep. Next, Puffy suffers a heart-wrenching blow when a charity event ends in tragedy. Nine young innocent people lost their lives on something that started out so, that's so innocent. I remember Puff at that time talking about contemplating suicide. And later, Puff Daddy catches a fly girl named Jennifer Lopez. Sparks was just flying all off me. And I got a phone call, and they were like, uh, Puff Daddy wants to talk to you. And I was like, what for? When Behind the Music continues. I can only remember Aaliyah Sane from a little bitty girl. She had her first platinum album at age 15. It was something I wanted to do for the rest of my life. She was a flower that was blooming. By 22, she was winning awards, starring in movies. She was going to be that large. And selling millions of albums. Aaliyah's going to take the world by storm. Then, the world lost Aaliyah. VH1's Behind the Music, The Aaliyah Story. I believe that she's here in spirit. Premieres next Sunday at 9, 8 Central. Followed by the premiere of Destiny's Child Fan Club, only on VH1. Do that dance, KD, do that dance, let's work it out. By the spring of 90, Puffy Combs' tenacious drive had earned him the chance of a lifetime. Because I came to have a good time, and at the end of the night, no doubt, I'm going to get mine. The 20-year-old had maneuvered his way from intern to executive at Andre Harrell's Uptown Records. I basically style and come up with the images and design most of the clothing for all of the artists. Charged with molding raw acts into something marketable. Oh, oh, oh. Puffy's first project was a young R&B group named Jodeci. Puffy engineered the group's hip street style, and their first album sold three million copies, making Puffy the crown prince of Uptown Records. I was enjoying every minute of it. You know, it was a dream come true. He was the intern that made good. He was absolutely on fire. In December of 91, Puffy planned to put his promotional skills to good use. He organized a charity basketball tournament at the City College of New York to raise money for AIDS research. I'm at City College in the heart of New York City for the Puff Daddy Heavy D first all-time celebrity all-star classic. As the players warmed up on the courts, fans lined up on the streets, but the crowd quickly outgrew the venue's capacity. Out of nowhere, this is, there's just like 6,000 people outside. Refusing to be turned away, an increasingly rowdy group of fans tried to force their way inside. The crowd started getting unruly, so they started knocking down the doors. And everybody would just push and push and push, so they bum rush the door. But the doors were constructed to open outward, not inward. And dozens of fans were trapped in the crush. When the crowd cleared, nine people lay dead. I was like, oh my God, you know, and it was just, I don't know, it was just, it was just the worst thing that you could ever imagine happening. One of the hardest things you ever had to do is stand up and, and take on some of the responsibility for the event. All of us must work together to let the facts about what we know went wrong and whatever must be done must be done to ensure that this never, ever, ever happens again. <sighs> In the aftermath of the tragedy, Puffy withdrew from his work and became deeply depressed. 
I remember Puff at that time talking about contemplating suicide. Well, I had to get in his ear and say, you must be crazy. You have something bigger than this to do. Do not take the opposite way. Do not run now. You come too far. Yo, Puff, that's that knock right there, boy. At the time, Puffy's friend Mary J. Blige was an unknown 20-year-old R&B singer signed to Uptown. She encouraged Puffy to get back to work, producing her debut album. She was an act that was like on the shelf, that they didn't really know what to do with. This is when everybody was trying to figure out, you know, what and who I was. Immediately, his ear would catch it like my ear caught it. So our chemistry was musically was crazy. That's why we had good music together. We had good chemistry. What's the 411, hun? What's the 411? I got it going on, hun. Hey, yo, I got it going on, hun. Puff played an intricate role in developing her career and developing the sound. And it exploded into commerce. In the summer of 92, Mary's debut album, What's the 411, struck platinum, selling three million copies. And when Mary J. Blige came in as the queen of hip-hop soul, she kicked the door down. Who are you? I'm Mary Blige and you just ain't running up at me. Yeah. Puffy was once again uptown's wonderkin, and his self-assured swagger wasn't checked at the boardroom door. There's just no way you can get enough of me. Yo, mister, big star. I would show up to work at 2 o'clock, you know, in the afternoon. He would walk around uptown's offices with his shirt off saying things like, Puff Daddy's my name when I'm a rapper, and Sean Combs is my name when I'm a movie star. Like, <laughs> he had it all figured out. I would come into a meeting, a board meeting, and just, you know, kick my feet up, and, you know, just be like, nah, you don't know what you're talking about. Who's doing that? I'll tell you right now, I don't want to be involved in that. I'm your mister. At that point, I knew there'd be no way for me to manage him. Puffy's ego had grown out of control, and Andre Harrell had all he could take. In the spring of 93, he decided to fire Puffy. Andre came into my office. He said to me that, um, I mean, you know, I'm sorry, but this ain't working out. And I thought I was going to pass out. So I had no choice but to grow up quick. And I had to grow up, like, in 48 hours. So I could rip the ligaments, put their bodies in the bad predicament. Coming up, a menacing rivalry poisons hip hop. It's unsafe for us just to walk the streets. And we didn't even say one bad thing about anybody, disrespect anybody. And then a hail of gunfire claims Puffy's closest friend. He didn't deserve to die, and it was just too much for me to handle. And it took a big toll on him. Losing a best friend and a brother. When Behind the Music continues. You're watching my VH1 Primetime. You're watching Say It Loud, the stories of black music told by its greatest artists. The five-part series continues tomorrow at 10, 9 central, only on VH1. The six-CD box set and the single-CD soundtrack on Rhino, available now at Best Buy. What's the full one? What's the 411? I got it going on, hey, yo, hun. I got it going on, hun. Puff Dandy's ballooning ego had cost him his job at Uptown Records in the spring of 93. I'm thinking, like, y'all really don't f this up. I done let down the person that gave me the chance and believed in me like nobody else. The 24-year-old pleaded with his mentor, Andre Harrell, for one more chance. I was scared to death. I mean, I had broke down. I was crying, everything. I was begging for my job. No question, he begged for his job back. I was depressed. I locked myself up in my room. When I came back out of the room, I turned the phone on, I checked the messages. I had, like, um, messages from like, almost every single record company um, offering me a label deal. That fall, Puffy decided to sign with Arista Records after one meeting with CEO Clive Davis. We had that spark. We had, uh, without question, a musical uh, connection. I said, this is a young man uh, that has something to say, that has a dream. Arista offered Puffy a $10 million deal to lead his own production company called Bad Boy. And Puffy recruited a solid stable of artists, including Craig Mack. And here comes the brand new 
flavor in your hair. Max a brand new flavor in your hair. Singer Faith Evans. And a hardcore rapper who called himself the Notorious B.I.G. I'm blowing up like you thought I would. Call a crib, same number, same hood. It's all good. He was just like a big fly muff. Biggie was a 300-pound former drug dealer right off the streets of Brooklyn. I make music about what I know. I see hustling, I see gambling, I see killing, I see girls, I see cars. That's what I rap about. I never thought it could happen, this rapping stuff. I was too used to packing gats and stuff. Biggie's debut album, Ready to Die, became an instant classic, selling more than four million copies. You got a gun up in your waist, please don't shoot up the place. Wow. And Puffy and Biggie became the best of friends. I love it when you call me Big Puff. Throw your hands in the air if you's a true player. More like a brother to me. I ain't got no kind of problems with Puff. For real, he handled his business. He makes sure I got money in my pocket. Right. Well, that's all I ask, really. God put him in my life, you know, for some happiness. He was making me happy. He was just so supportive as an artist and as a friend. Uh, Puff Daddy, Biggie Small. On the heels of their massively successful collaboration, Biggie encouraged Puffy to follow his dream. Biggie was like, come on, you know you want to rap. You know deep down inside you want to do your thing. I'm going to help you with that, you know. I know you helped my dream come true. I'm going to help your dream come true. With Biggie as his coach, Puffy set out to work on his debut album. But a dark cloud was descending on hip hop. Bitter rivalry had erupted between Bad Boy and the West Coast label, Death Row. Any artist out there want to be an artist and want to stay a star, and don't want to, and want to have to worry about the executive producer trying to be all in the videos, all on the record, dancing, come to Death Row. At the 1995 Source Awards, Suge Knight, the CEO of Death Row, publicly insulted Puffy on stage, inflaming the so-called East Coast-West Coast feud. The East Coast ain't got no love for Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg and Death Row. Y'all don't love us. From the outset, Puffy said he tried to squelch the tensions. I'm the executive producer that a comment was made about a little bit earlier. Contrary to what other people may feel, and I'm very proud of Dr. Dre, of Death Row, and Suge Knight for their accomplishments. You know what I'm saying? I'm a positive black man, and I make music to bring us together, not to separate us. And all this East and West that needs to stop. One love. It was unfair being involved in um, something as stupid as the East Coast, West Coast, like whatever the media wanted to call a feud or whatever for like two years and we never even did nothing. And we felt like that, it's, it's unsafe for us just to walk the streets. Then on September 7th, 1996, the assassination of a rap legend would fuel the animosity. Death Row artist Tupac Shakur was gunned down in Las Vegas as he rode in the passenger seat of Suge Knight's BMW. Just six months later, the notorious B.I.G. would meet a strikingly similar fate. Shots rang out, I ducked down, and then I heard somebody say Biggie's car had got shot at. On March 8, 1997, Biggie was shot five times as he and Puffy departed an industry party in Los Angeles. Puffy watched helplessly as his best friend slipped away. He didn't deserve to die, and it was just too much for me to handle. It's a point where, like, I wouldn't even move. I would not get up out of bed. I wouldn't eat, and I would just... I was just like, yo, this is it, man. I can't do it no more. That destroyed my son. He just went off when that happened to Biggie. Because they were close, they were like brothers. It took a big toll on him. So I'm laying in bed and MTV is on and an old video came on. Um, it was Every Breath You Take um, by the police. And I just felt like he was talking to me through that song. Every breath you take. I 
just had an idea I wanted to talk back to him through that same song. Check it. Seems like yesterday we used to rock the show. I laced the track, you locked the flow. Puffy took the melody from the police song and composed his own rhymes to accompany it. Rhymes that conveyed his profound sense of grief over Biggie's death. Life ain't always what it seemed to be. Words can't express what you mean to me. Even though you're gone, we still a team. Through your family, I feel your dreams. I'll Be Missing You became the first single off Puffy's 1997 solo album, No Way Out. It was a fitting tribute to the man who had encouraged Puffy to step into the spotlight and rap on his own. The people who say that he was exploiting Biggie's legacy and memory by coming out with an album so soon after Biggie's death, what, what they don't understand is that Biggie really wouldn't have wanted it any other way. Yo, yo, this makes, you know what I'm saying? Puffy changed the tone with his second single, Been Around the World. For the video, he cast a rising movie star named Jennifer Lopez. He's so handsome. My light bulb went off. I just saw Selena. I said, I know Honey could dance. Let me call her, see if she's with it. He was like, so you used to dance, right? And I go, yeah, yeah, I used to dance. And he's like, I think it's time to let people know that you can dance again. And I was like, you know what? You're right. <laughs> On the video set, the electricity between Puffy and Jennifer was red hot. I had my own sparks, you know what I'm saying? You look at Honey, my sparks was just flying all off me. But neither was in a position to do anything about it. She was married at the time, but I was in my, uh, my own relationship, so I had to have self-control. And then we just became friends. Propelled by the success of four top ten singles, Puffy's album No Way Out became a massive hit selling a staggering seven million copies. It was like a dream come true to see the lines like in front of the stores, like and people going there to get my record. It's, it's crazy. You name it, I could claim it. Young, black, and famous with money hanging out the anus. How you doing? Great, happy birthday. How does it feel? It feels great. Puff Daddy celebrated his success in November of 98 by throwing a massive bash for his 29th birthday. He's my neighbor in East Hampton. He continues to push, he continues to make us dream, and he continues to make us know that if we work hard, we can do the same thing. But if we can get better than this, I don't, I don't know, man. All he needed was the right woman. Puffy had been through two significant long-term relationships, one with Misa Hilton and another with model Kim Porter. Both relationships resulted in the birth of a son, but Puffy was never able to commit to marriage. I think that that just makes him nervous to give that much of himself to someone. He has to have total control, and he would be giving up some. I'm a tough person to be in a relationship with as far as, like, a man um, treating a woman and also balancing my career. I, I, can't, I can't say that I really knew how to do that. But in Jennifer Lopez, Puffy believed he had found someone who shared his passion and ambition. I was a dancer, she was a dancer. I was ambitious, she was ambitious. I, I was a workaholic, she was a workaholic. But at first, all of those things um, was working and our benefit. Jennifer's marriage came to an end in 1998. They were finally able to embark on the romance they had been resisting. Things started to happen. I started looking into her eyes more, spending more time with her, and I just fell in love with her. To have somebody who, by your side, who understands what you're going through, when at the end of the day, doesn't need anything from you except to love you. She was one of the nicest, most beautiful people that I had met, you know. Next, a night out leads to a shootout. The papers and the TV reports were looking like I was about to go to jail for a long time. And then hip-hop's royal couple calls it quits. The relationship took all they could take, and it had broke right in the middle of the trial. It was like devastating, you know? When Behind the Music continues. Uh. 
Puff Daddy entered 1999 on top. His net worth was calculated at close to a quarter billion dollars. It's all about the Benjamins, what? I get a and he had expanded his empire to include a street-inspired fashion line called Sean John and a trendy New York restaurant he named Justin's after his son. Puffy was on a roll. He had Jennifer Lopez on his arms, this sultry Latina singer, and he's the king of rap. We was just both in love with each other, just like to spend every moment and every second with each other. The paparazzi was unbelievable. I had never seen that like that. It was like the movies. When Puffy showed up at the 2000 Grammys with Jennifer Lopez on his arm in a Versace dress that defied the laws of physics, he was the envy of men everywhere. I don't really know how long it took her to get into the dress because I was getting dressed in another room but I know it only took me a second to get out of it. <laughs> but over the course of the next year, Puffy's charmed life would be tainted by tabloid headlines. You can hate me now, QB, but I won't stop now. In April of 99, Puffy was arrested for assaulting Interscope Records executive Steve Stout following a business dispute. I would compare it to like if you have a friend or acquaintance and you feel like you were wrong and y'all have a fist fight. But according to the criminal complaint, it was more than a mere tussle. Stout claimed he was struck with objects, including a champagne bottle, a chair, and a telephone, leaving him bloodied with a broken arm and jaw. Puffy pled guilty to harassment and was ordered to undergo anger management therapy. I should have known better because I, mean, I was brought up in church. I have a certain level of spirituality. Um, I love God, and, you know, I made the mistake and I wasn't thinking, so I was wrong all the way around. Made a lot of mistakes. No matter what, you've always been by my side. Later that year, it was Puffy's turn to take a beating at the hands of music critics who KO'd his second album the boldly entitled Forever. Forever, forever. Time, time. Rolling Stone called the record too eager to please, giving it a mere two and a half stars. Puffy got a new album. Can't talk about music without talking about Puffy. I know I may get my ass whooped for this, but who gives it? Who don't care? Puffy got a new album called Forever. Forever? What you trying to say, Puff? Forever? You know if the album don't sell, the next one gonna be called How About Three More Months? Come on! There was a time, you know, to be in any way uh, supportive of Puffy was like just treason <laughs> on a critical level. It was also a trying time in Puffy's personal life. He says his relationship with Jennifer Lopez was starting to suffer from the excessive demands of their careers. She has to work a lot, I have to work a lot. And it's like the distance and everything start putting a strain on a relationship. And a looming scandal would prove lethal to their romance. On December 27th, 1999, Jennifer and Puffy decided to kick off their New Year's holiday at a Manhattan disco called Club New York. I wish I would just stay my ass at home and chill with Jennifer. I just wish the whole night wouldn't have happened. At the club, they partied with a large entourage, including bad boy rapper Jamal Shine Barrow. They were in the VIP section. People were looking at them, you know, Puffy was dancing. He had two bubblies in his hands. Around 2 a.m., Puffy and his crew started to make their way out of the club. Puffy is still giving her high fives, shaking hands, embracing people, you know, telling them Happy New Year and different things. And um, he goes over to high five someone, and this guy just pulls away. And of course, that was a diss. A scuffle broke out between several club goers and members of Puffy's entourage. The guy who uh, refused to shake Puffy's hand, you know, comes up and, you know, started attacking Puffy and saying, you know, you, you, you know, you know, real rapper, you know, you're a punk, you know, you're not, you're not the only one with money. He approached Puffy in a taunting way and said, you're nothing and I have money too. And in a taunt gesture, threw money in Puffy's direction. As the confrontation escalated, witnesses claim Shine Barrow reached for a gun. He drew a weapon, fired three or four shots. 
Once the shots were fired, all hell broke loose. Three people were hit by stray bullets, and the crowd rushed to the exits. There's a fire, everybody hits the ground. We get out of there, we just flee in the scene, kind of just getting away from home, not really understanding what just went on. Puffy and Jennifer jumped into their SUV and ordered the driver to speed away. Don't, don't stop. Police say they ran 11 red lights before they were pulled over. An officer searched the vehicle and found a loaded 9mm handgun under the front passenger seat. They say that we were evading police and I had a gun. Puffy was booked and held on gun possession charges, igniting a media frenzy. I want to make this 100% clear. I had nothing to do with a shooting in this club. And I feel terrible that people were hurt that night. Puffy's legal troubles only worsened when police added bribery to the charges. Puffy's driver, Wardell Fenderson, came forward to claim that Puffy had offered him cash to take the rap and claim the gun in the SUV belonged to him. Allegedly, Puffy turns to the driver and whispers in his ear, you got to take this rap, take the gun, say the gun is yours, I'll give you $50,000, please take it. It just kept on getting worse and worse and worse from nothing. I'm just being at the wrong place at the wrong time, dropping to the floor, getting up and getting out of the club, turned into this whole big, you know, worldwide conspiracy. No fun fleeing under the gun, cause they got me public enemy number one. One, 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 one. In January 2001, Puffy entered a New York court to defend himself against felony gun possession and bribery charges. His friend Jamal Shine Barrow stood accused of attempted murder. They were really trying to railroad my son, and I saw it. And that's why I was there every single day to hear everything. My son is crying on the phone every day. He's like scared that I'm gonna go to jail. My mother is stressed out. Jennifer, then I know, I'm knowing that things ain't working out. When it's all over, whenever that is, whatever happens, it'll be a very happy day once it's not something we have to think about. Let me ask you what you got against me. Is it my girl or is it the Bentley? Is it my The staggering pressure of the trial brought Puffy and Jennifer's relationship to a breaking point. I was feeling like, you know, due to my problems, it was starting to hurt her. And I think she was agreeing. I think her management was agreeing. I think her family was agreeing. The best thing is I like, try to let her do her thing. Close my eyes. On Valentine's Day 2001, Puffy and Jennifer announced their split. She's going a separate way, and this is a time when I ain't wanting her to go a separate way, and it's like, I'm needing her. It's like a tragedy that it ain't work out. She's somebody that I'll always love, no matter if she's married with 20 children. I'll always love her. On top of the heartbreak, Puffy was facing 15 years in prison, and the testimony at times seemed damning. You can't run, you can't hide, no surprise, close your eyes, come with me, come with me. I'm fortunate to be alive. When one of the victims took the stand and claimed that she had seen Puffy with a gun that night, Puffy started to believe he could lose the case. I was shot in my face, and I never expected to be a part of such a reckless act of violence. The only time I saw any fear on, uh, on Puffy's face was during the testimony of Natanya Rubin. She described seeing him with a gun. She described the, the, the bullet as a, like a hot sledgehammer hitting her face. Puffy you know, shook his head at that point in time, you know, as if to say, I'm not responsible for this. I just felt like I was going to die, like inside. So I would just be there in the courthouse, just be like, like What's going on? How's my, how's, this, like, how's my life becoming this? That's like probably my, my weakest point. Next, Puffy awaits the verdict. Everything was just stacked up against me. It just felt like, oh man, it's like the worst nightmare. When Behind the Music continues. In February of 2001, Puff Daddy was at the center of a legal nightmare, facing 15 years in prison for gun possession and bribery. Yeah! 
I had felt like I lost everything. You know what I'm saying? I had the papers and the TV reports was looking like I was about to go to jail for a long time. On March 16th, 2001, the jury announced it had reached a verdict. Tensions in the courtroom were heightened. I'm upset, I'm concerned, and I'm nervous. And, I mean, all I'm thinking about is, like, my kids. When the verdict was read, Puffy just put his head down, you know, not guilty on all counts. It was a big relief for him, and, you know, he started to live again. I just want to say I give all glory to God. I give all glory to God. If it wasn't for God, I wouldn't be able to walk out here to talk to y'all today. Puffy was a free man, but his friend Shine Barrow was not as fortunate. He was convicted of first-degree assault and sentenced to 10 years in prison. I'm glad that the truth is out. I'm glad everybody knows I'm innocent, I'm not guilty. But then also it's like a bittersweet situation because a situation that took a lot out of people's lives, a lot of time from people, um, situation where, you know, you have shot, incarcerated. The verdict left Puffy legally vindicated, but it couldn't soothe the sting of losing the love of his life, Jennifer Lopez. The relationship took all it could take. It had broke, so it was like, it was like devastating, you know? That's what I never could build up the words to express how I loved her. Puffy believes his fear of commitment was partially to blame for the breakup, and the heartbreak he suffered forced him to re-examine his priorities in life. Jennifer had hurt so much, it like, just made me promise if I ever, you know, fell in love with somebody, like I wouldn't be scared, you know what I'm saying? I have no fears with big things, you know what I'm saying? I'm trying to have no fears with little things, and that's more with the personal life stuff. After the trial, Puffy committed himself to his family, carving more time out of his schedule to spend with his two young sons. I feel real blessed. I still got a chance to, at the end of the day, you know, really achieve success, you know, which is being personally happy and making your family and all your friends happy, totally happy. In a symbolic break from the past, he publicly shed his Puff Daddy moniker and adopted a new one, P. Diddy. A name first given to him by his slain friend, Biggie Smalls. You can still call me Puffy, though, but, you know, we're going to a new level of flavor. We're going into a new era. The saga's going to continue. In June of 2001, P. Diddy released his third album, aptly entitled, The Saga Continues. It's official. I survived what I've been through. Y'all got drama. The saga continues. At the age of 31, P. Diddy proudly proclaimed his status as the ultimate hip-hop survivor. We can't stop now, cause it's bad boy. Hey, as bottomless as the hole as you think he's in, he comes up out like a whirlwind and like a shooting star into the sky. We're still here, you're rocking with the best. Don't worry if I write rhymes, I write checks. You know why he made mistakes? Is because he's a chance taker. That's what makes him so potent, so powerful. And if you don't feel me, that means you can't touch me. It's ugly, trust me. Love that mother to death, man. He's necessary. With a lifetime of drama behind him, P. Diddy says he is back to doing what he does best, showing everyone a good time. There's so many dark things going on in the world. Everybody needs something to pick their day up. Anybody really knows me, they know I like to have fun, and that's what I want to give people. We can't be stopped now, because it's bad boy for life. Name it, I could claim it. Young, black, and famous. With money hanging out the anus. And when you need a hit, who you going to get? Bet against us? Nah, it's no bet. We made hits that'll rearrange your whole set. And got a Benz that I ain't even drove yet. 